I tell you this because I want you to know I know something now about the National Energy Labs. I ought to, given what I did for the last 17, uh, 18 months. Um, we here in Pittsburgh and in this region are very lucky that one of these 17 laboratories is here, the National Energy Technology Laboratory, the nation's fossil energy laboratory, fossil energy plus laboratory. Uh, this is something we're very lucky to have. Uh, the very first conclusion and recommendation of this commission that I co-chaired was that the National Energy Laboratories represent uh, a tremendous national asset for this country, really a treasure. And the recommendation was to Congress, you better support it because it needs support and deserves support. And we, lucky us, have one of these 17 laboratories. We all are lucky today to have with us the director of the National Energy Technology Laboratory. Grace Bohenick became a director of uh, NETL in October 2014. Um, after 25 years of uh, leadership positions related to research and technology in the Defense Department, most recently, before joining NETL, she was the Chief Technology Officer of the U.S. Army Materiel Command. Dr. Bohenick has a bachelor's degree from Wayne State University, a master's from the University of Michigan, and a Ph.D. from Central Florida University. Uh, we're very, very pleased to have her with us today. Dr. Bohenick. Well, hello. How's everybody today? It's great to be here. It's, uh, well, it's always great to be on a, a great campus, especially one uh, with such uh, prestige across the nation um, as uh, Carnegie Mellon University. So um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cohen, for number one, for inviting uh, me to come and talk to you, but more importantly, uh, for recognizing the important partnership and the importance of uh, the National Energy Technology Lab and really all the national labs. As we all are, you know, I, I was, as I was thinking about what the president had to say, as we we're thinking about this next fourth industrial revolution that, is, that, that we're all in the middle of, uh, how important it is to have um, a federal Department of Energy laboratory the right universities and the right industry players in one region where we can all really get together and um, make a difference, make a difference not only for our region, um, <clears throat> but for our, for our country. So I surely appreciate it. It's a great day to be here. And I, and I look forward uh, to many, many uh, follow-on um, discussions as, as we kind of build on this partnership. So I, I'm, what I thought I would do, and I hope there's a th couple things I'd like to accomplish. One is to reintroduce um, the National Energy Technology Lab to many, many in the audience. And, and maybe there's many in the audience who aren't that aware of what the National Energy Technology Lab is and the importance of what we, we, what we are all undertaking. So when I, when I think about the world today and Again, what is happening in terms of, you know, whether you, whether, you, whether you say we have about 7 billion people on the earth today and that in some time in about the 2100, uh, it's predicted to be about 16 billion. And all 16 billion people have to have food, water, and energy because all of those things are the, the natural things that help us have quality of life. And so when you think about the global population growth, and these unprecedented levels of, of having accessible, affordable, and abundant food, energy, and water. And this is really what we are all about. And you can, you know, you can think about things in, in terms of how they're all coupled together. And I think that's what that, that bubble chart to the right is, that just, you know, as you increase your energy use, you also are increasing as you move up the scale uh, to the quality of life. And I think at the most fundamental level, these are the drivers for all of us as we pursue our daily um, you know, efforts, as our daily um, technology development efforts and, and scientific breakthroughs. So let me tell you just real quickly to kind of shape the, uh, shape the landscape a little bit. Um, if you think about 
the all of the above strategy, which the, the president has put, put out there, you know, as part of the all above strategy, which is really helping us drive all the way down inside of the laboratory that I run, it's pretty important to think about in that it's about fuel efficiency. It's about clean coal. It's about nuclear, oil, solar, biofuels, wind, natural gases. It really truly is an all above look, a holistic look of what we will need in the future, again, to have affordable, reliable energy and clean energy for the future. And within the president's priorities, at least for, for a laboratory that has its roots in fossil energy, of utmost importance is how, how and how do we move forward with carbon capture and the storage of carbon? How do we have safe and responsible domestic oil and gas production? Advancing energy efficiencies, clean fuels, those are all part of the higher priorities. And what I like about this slide is it clearly says that we're all in it, right? From, from how it looks at the national level, how that president's strategy drives into the Department of Energy strategy, how that drives into, uh, for many of you who have an opportunity to maybe uh, Google the Department of Energy, it's Quadrennial Energy Review and the Quadrennial Technology Review, which gives, gives us global um, goals which we're trying to achieve, that then drives into, at the very bottom, as NETL looks at its capabilities and how we have to create a strategy and a technology roadmap to help us deliver that capability. And again, when we're all in it, we're all going to be successful. And the all above strategy really is a, a national uh, mission. Another way to look at fossil energy, and, and many times, again, coming from a fossil energy background, as this region does, to some sense, is to, to also show people data that says, you know, when you look at, and this is a world energy demand, and you can see the percentages of coal, oil, and gas, which is in 2014. And no matter how you look at the future, whether you're thinking about a six degree stabilization of the environment to four to two, you can still see there's this going to be this reliance or need for affordable, sustainable fossil energy resources and resource um, usage. And so it is a real important part of our strategy, again, knowing that we can't predict exactly the future because many of these, the dynamics will be uh, based on um, economics and, and policy decisions, but we know we have to have technology solutions that'll drive us in the right direction and offer is um, the most optimal um, options as we can um, to our country and to our nation. And I think that, you know, the innovation is going to occur because we, we know we have to be on this very drastic slope and the delivering of these technologies in, in, in a multiple scenarios is also going to help us uh, think about innovation in a very different, different way. Another way to look at, at how we deliver energy is, you know, again, on the left is uh, pretty much all of the specific fuels within in our portfolio today. And then as you look at how those fuels fit in, feed into the, you know, into the, um, into the sectors, whether that's residential and commercial, all the way down to power. The important part of that, again, on the domestic level today, and again, these could be, you know, there's probably ranges of numbers. These are coming from uh, some of the some of the data and the data analysis at IEA and other organizations, like even inside of NETL. But what it's saying is that it's a complex uh, landscape. Energy is a complex landscape. And when you have multiple energy sources, multiple sectors, and how do you how do you really look that look at all of that and drive down to affordable affordability? drive down towards better efficiencies and better usage of, of, of our output. Again, uh, pretty, pretty much shows that it's uh, fossil energy is, uh, dominates in all of these sectors. So that brings me down to the National Energy Technology Lab. And so NETL has multiple facilities and multiple laboratories. We have one here in Pittsburgh. We have one in um, Morgantown, West Virginia. And then we have another lab on the West Coast um, um, near Albany, uh, Oregon, 
And what's important about it, that is that we are one of the 17 uh, national labs. I think within the Department of Energy, you're seeing more and more cross integration of the laboratories, bringing greater capability um, to some of these problem sets, whether you're, you know, whether we're looking at cha uh, challenges in the subsurface where multiple laboratories are working. I think the most important thing is, you know, it is a, a national gem. I'm, I'm so happy that the Crenel report came out and stated those things because these laboratories are laboratories and the capabilities they bring and the reach they have, whether they're with academia or industries, is a pretty powerful, powerful um, network. The one difference is NETL is, uh, is, NETL is considered a government-owned and government-operated oper laboratory. But with that, brings some uniqueness. And I'd like to just share that with you uh, real quickly um, in a few slides. So when you look at NETL, again, a laboratory not too far from here, we have over, an, uh, over 1,400 ongoing R&D projects to date. And they really touch about 50 different states, multiple universities. Uh, but there's about 1,400 employees. Again, I mentioned the fact that we have three labs. The other two labs, I would more consider them offices. We have one in Houston and one in Alaska, predominantly because those are the regions uh, that affect uh, some of our, our fossil energy portfolio. And then you can see um, our budget. When I think about as I break that down into a region, uh, I think it's pretty powerful to say that uh, as NETL sits in this region, and I think of this region as more like, I call it an energy innovation ecosystem. And what I mean by that is, you know, this is a community that's such rich in history. I mean, it's, to me, it's pretty amazing. Um, you know, when you have, for instance, like NETL, over a hundred year organization, you have universities that have that same in the industry. And it's just, you know, there, there's something about it, right? There's something about the network, the culture, the people the people that carried us in that first energy <laughs> revolution are the ones that are going to carry us uh, through this next one. And so I just want to say that being here is important. It's very important to the National Lab. It's important because we have such, we have a luxury of reach to some of the best universities and Carnegie Mellon sits right there um, as a true, true partner. So when we think about that, you know, we've had, we've had a long relationship with uh, Carnegie Mellon. I think over the past years, I'm, you know, many of the topics that are driving the, the development of the, um, the Scott Institute here are things we worked on together, whether that's shale gas, uh, solid oxide fuel cells, uh, high performance and high power computing, and just some fundamental modeling at the molecular level. These are things that, that we've done and we've done uh, very well and they've helped us um, move forward in many, many of the efforts that we have ongoing inside of the laboratory. So when you think about NETL as a lab, and you'll see that I'm gonna build all of this up so that at the end of this, you understand how important it is for us to figure out how best to partner with each other. As a national laboratory, it is about maturing technology. And most importantly, not just maturing technology, but moving it moving it to commercialization. Um, many of us that have been in the R&D world for all of our lives, we hear about you know, the valley of death, you hear about all of these things, and you can see the tremendous focus we're putting in on innovation, entrepreneurship, tech transfer. We have to crack that code in a different way than we've done in the past. And so when you think about NETL as a government laboratory, just think about how we, can, how we can manage to work with each other at different levels, all the way from the most early, um, you know, early basic to applied research on the bottom, where we can do some of the things in, intramurally in our own lab or partner with you extramurally, all the way to the luxury of being able to do something at a huge large scale, a large scale deployment. And that's the uniqueness of what we have here in this region. You have a laboratory that can span that um, technology maturity spectrum, can partner in different ways and have different tools that allow us um, uh, the luxury to do that. So when I drill down inside of our laboratory, these are pretty much our core competencies. And they're vital to addressing. They were vital to addressing the early the early use of any kind of uh, coal power generation, 
um, what happened in the shale industry, what we look forward to if you think about methane hydrates. These are the same core competencies uh, that are necessary. When you think about computational um, yeah, engineering, uh, the, the fact that having more integrated predictive computational tools, things that can go all the way from the atomic level to being able to do economic kind of analysis and computing in a variety of uh, technology spaces and a, a variety of different, you know, political or economic situations, we have some of that capability. Uh, materials engineering, everything from material solutions uh, for, you know, current or next generation uh, capabilities, it really does fundamentally fall onto some um, material levels because as we think about some of the things we're working on, higher temperatures, higher pressures requires a whole different look at uh, materials and, and and being able to uh, address those materials at, a, at both a functional level and at a molecular level are, are pretty important. Uh, geolog geological environmental systems, um, again, uh, being able to engineer these naturally, these naturally formed formations and systems that we have in the subsurface. And being able to do that in a way that protects the environment, so, so very, very key. Uh, our ability to convert energy uh, all the way from, you know, when people talk about uh, solid oxide fuel cells to the potential of, you know, um, super critical CO2 cycles, the ability to, to convert energy and even biofuels, right, all of those kind of things. And then systems engineering and analysis. It is the one area that, you know, coming in um, from the defense side into the energy business I find uh, really critical, I found it critical in the defense side is when you're thinking about getting into these large scale deployments, the management of risk is really, really critical when you're thinking about large scale deployment of anything and using some very fundamental systems engineering principles and our ability to optimize and validate every step of the way is, is very, very important. So again, some of the very core technical competencies that exist inside of NETL and I know exist inside of, of the university structures in a variety of different ways. If you think about NETL in a different way, and many of you may have had some exposure to this, is we also have what I would call these technology thrusts. And they happen to be, they happen to be focused around, around the, you know, the, the fuel, the, the source, right? Around coal or oil and, oil and gas. The importance of this is that these technology thrusts Almost, you know, you have a, a, a matrix of what you need for each one of these problem sets in order to, um, to, to solve them. And these are things that we're working on today, and I'm going to um, cover a couple of those uh, in the next following slides. So when you think about the coal program itself, again, these are just highlights. But it looks, you know, it's a program, again, it's, when you think about the budget, it's a pretty significant budget. But everything from, you know, cross-cutting uh, research, which includes, you know, things in sensors and controls and, you know, in, in some ways uh, simulation-based engineering um, software uh, kind of gets developed in the cross technologies all the way as we move for advancing the systems. If you look on the bottom, again, from applied to what you might do um, engineering development all the way through to pre-commercialization, and then demonstration. And I'm going to cover um, the CO2 uh, capture and uh, CO2 storage program. Again, the importance of this is that, you know, it's a broad spectrum portfolio. It touches many, many um, technologies and capabilities, and we partner in different ways for different efforts um, um, to accelerate the, the things that we do. So when I look at carbon capture, I, I think it's, it's, you know, when you think about the mission, right, we, we have to have the ability to capture that, whether it's uh, pre or post combustion. And what's really important is the work that we're doing. And the work that we're doing, again, if you, lead, if you kind of read the chart from left to right, it kind of helps you understand the program in the sense that all the way from at the most fundamental level on the left hand side about materials, right? The, the discovering new sorbents, new solvents. Um, the, the ability to increase our CO2 loading capacity or absorption capacity, um, different separation kind of techniques and technologies at the most fundamental level that, that we, we help develop or we do this in partnership again with industry universities and national labs. And then we move that into, uh, again, as a, as a part of a process as you scale it up into laboratory bench, which many of, the, many of you in the universities have that capability um, uh, 
ability to look at the analytics and the process of designing and then scaling up, and then all the way to movement of, uh, to our pilot uh, projects. You'll see if you go on to, um, actually onto some of our, our websites, you'll notice that NETL engages heavily in these large scale pilots, and primarily because we have to, you know, when the maturing of the technologies Part of it is that the challenge has always been about multiple technologies and the integration of those technologies on the larger scale. And so there's a lot of effort into trying to reduce risk by number one, working with large scale industry to help drive the integration of those technologies, but really trying to address at a system level how you can uh, mature and move it forward. And then to kind of couple all of that on the right, throughout this entire process is develop, developing a, a full set of uh, tools. We have something called the Carbon Capture uh, Simulation Initiative. I think uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon actually was uh, a partner and a part of that process. And really it's about, you know, if, if, you, if you want to go from small scale pilot to large scale pilot to, a, to actually full deployment, it's all about the, you know, the time it takes to design and integrate and it's about reducing that time, it's about reducing the risk, it's about quantifying what you need to quantify to make the decisions to actually move. So we've actually built a significant uh, level of communication tools that are, are now being used, or computational tools that are helping us to do that acceleration. If you look at our carbon storage program, again, another fascinating part of, of what we do, and I think to me, is, is part of one of the most fascinating and interesting parts is because it's all about, you know, it's about, first of all, storing, but really understanding the infrastructure in the subsurface and, and understanding how we could move forward with not only, you know, storing technologies, uh, storing uh, carbon, but doing it in, in a way uh, that, that protects our environment. So our program today is really, uh, has two sections to it. It has an advanced storage and then it has a storage infrastructure component to it. Inside the advanced storage component, it really is about the monitoring and verification of, 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 the, of, of um, carbon um, storage. How are we going to monitor it? How are we going to ensure, um, you know, uh, well integrity? Uh, how are we going to make sure that we don't have any kind of leakage? So there's a big significant portion about um, verification and monitoring. And again, there's a, a, a large simulation or computational um, engineering aspect to all that, which is part of the geological storage and simulation and risk. Again, trying to understand the subsurface in a way so that we could, um, again, understand it in terms of uh, predicting risk, understanding movement in the, in the subsurface, in those kind of, um, kind of uh, second, third order effects of, of using carbon and storing carbon. And then, this, and then the, the whole uh, storage infrastructure. Um, I think what the, the department did, and it's been an ongoing program for at least uh, five years through the Regional Carbon Sequestration Partnership, is really to try to understand, again, at a regional, uh, a regional level, um, what were the opportunities for storage. So there was a large characterization effort that occurred, and then characterization, and then we also did some, um, obviously, some sequestration of carbon. And we're also now looking, um, when we think about offshore, and some of the things that have occurred into the Gulf, a significant modeling effort about, you know, how do you uh, reduce the risks of the, some of the things that have occurred in the Gulf. And many of these things, if you look at the bottom tagline, I encourage, I encourage you to uh, go to that website. There's a lot of information. Uh, one thing that part of this whole program um, is about uh, improving awareness, both at the state level, at the federal level, uh, much of this information, again, is, is public, it's public domain, that's part of this entire um, um, carbon storage program. Again, real, real important, because as we think about uh, the, whole, the whole aspect of, you know, from carbon capture to storage, we have to find some way or somewhere to put that, that carbon. We either have to have uh, carbon reuse, we have to look at options of carbon storage, and any other options that will help us make um, the, uh, the uh, carbon capture effort a little bit more economically viable. Now if I kind of move over to our oil and gas program, again another way to look at it, uh, uh, again a pretty significant program, a uh, 63 million dollar program, and it really covers those four areas from environmentally prudent development, 
And when you think about that, you know, it, it, this again is about how are we looking at the characterization of, of both, you know, uh, and, and ensuring water quality and all of those kind of uh, air quality, a lot of data monitoring, all feeding into a larger scale, um, what's called this frac focus uh, database. Again, a lot of information on, on detailed bowl, uh, well water and chemical information that throughout this process. The unconventional onshore and offshore, again, this part of the program has to do with well bore integrity, uh, a lot of work in something called foam cements and advanced drilling and safety. Uh, many of the things that, uh, uh, again, expertise that rely, that's, that res that's resident both in NETL and I think in this region. Uh, methane hydrates, I'll cover that in a, in, a, in a few minutes. And then, of course, midstream, which really is looking at methane quantification and, and uh, the pipeline mitigation. Just the fact that you have miles and miles of this pipe, how are we monitoring it, how are we maintaining it, how are we ensuring the integrity of that phase of the process ensuring we're not having any kind of a leakages, especially from, um, from methanes. So when you think about methane hydrates, when you think about methane, is that, yeah, okay, gas hydrates. So yeah, when you think about that, um, I find it, you know, so there's, there's a couple things that we're doing, right? First of all, it's focused on the environmental, the environmental and climate impacts of both what's in the, what we would call the marine and Arctic resources of, of, of methane. In two, and we're doing two, two things that are pretty important. Uh, there are going to be two large field site developments that are um, up and coming. One of them is going to be in the north slope of Alaska. And, then this, and we're doing that in uh, collaboration with Japan. And then, of course, we're going to be doing some characterizations in the Gulf of Mexico. And we're doing that with uh, the University of, of Texas. But within that, again, uh, if you think about, uh, you know, you think about it, it's about characterization, exploration. Um, our understanding of it, our understanding of what kind of resource is this, how abundant is it, um, is it a viable resource, are there technologies for us to think about how we have to produce that, that, and then at the same time understanding any kind of impacts that it may have to, to climate change. So this has a very international feel to it because we're all interested in this, we know the resources there, um, we have to better understand it because as the climate changes, um, the climate change alone will, um, will affect the, these kind of emissions and we're going to have to better understand it. I think this is a right space for, for much of the innovation that we will see coming out of the laboratory in the next, you know, five to ten years. So what's happening in innovation um, and innovation inside of um, the department? When you think about, and I call it, you know, innovation really is a contact sport. It's one of the reasons I'm here. I'm, 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 I want to make sure that as a viable partner, the university is engaging with us in a, maybe, in, you know, in an accelerated different way. There are many things that I see about this region, whether or not, you know, we, we all sat down in, you know, the three states, uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, the governors got together and agreed uh, through a tri-state shale summit to work together, right, to work this issue for the region. At the same time, uh, if you were at COP21, which occurred uh, in November of last year, there was 20 countries that all stood up together uh, arm to arm and agreed to double um, their energy budgets over the next five years, uh, all in the space of, of clean energy. And it's, so it's a multi, you know, multilateral government initiative where there's a focus on clean energy, and within that clean energy space, you can be guaranteed in order to achieve those energy goals, there's what we need to do with fossil energy, and that is through you know, carbon capture, carbon sequestration, and other innovative, novel, maybe techniques. In the same time as we're all unveiling and looking at mission innovation, there's also what's called the Breakthrough Energy Coalition. Uh, which was recently established. Uh, Bill Gates is the founder of that coalition, and it's a you know a, a group of 29 private investors and business leaders, and from 10 different countries, and they are focusing on investing in clean energy. Uh, I'm understanding, and I'm understanding that Bill Gates is going to invest over one billion dollars, and other members are doing the same, and they're going to be combining all of their assets again to try to drive this. So why do I put this up? because I think we are all in the right place at the right time. The country is ready for innovation. We have the right expertise in our region. 
Um, and we have the right innovators. We've innovated in the past. We will innovate in the future and we'll be able to take advantage of some of these opportunities um, that will be coming to bear, whether it's through the Breakthrough Energy Coalition or things that happen inside of the department itself. So I say this uh, in a way that says, hey, we need to do this together. Uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, NETL, a very important partnership, one that we've had for a long time. There are many ways to partner with a national lab, especially our lab, and so I, I'm putting that out there for you. Um, and, you know, one is, you know, the government is a government lab. We, we partner by giving money to universities or others to help us move technology and develop technology through a normal, what we would call the, you know, the FOA process, which many of you are probably familiar with. But there are other ways, and so I put the second way, which is the business opportunities with inside of NETL. There's ways to us to partner in different ways where potentially we could just collaborate using cooperative research agreements, other ways to share laboratories, facilities, people. And again, I'm reaching out because I think that we have an opportunity here. So I say, you know, let's, let's figure this all out. Again, please follow the, you know, the um, National Energy Technology Lab. And I just encourage all of us, and you'll see more and more of these activities. I, I, I'm thankful that the Scott uh, Energy Institute is, this is its first inaugural. I'm happy to have been here for that and just to encourage the kind of partnership that I think uh, will help us accomplish some of these very, very lofty goals that we have. So thank you very much. I hope everybody um, has a great five days here. Um, you'll see me in and out during, you know, during the whole week. So um, look, for, look forward to any kind of sidebar discussions. Thank you.